Within the sweltering jungles of Vietnam, where every shadow hid an unseen threat, and the foliage and thick canopies were accomplices to Viet Cong ambushes and traps, the M67 Zippo tank lay in wait. With flames licking in the air and thunder roaring from its belly, the Zippo charged into battle, ready to deliver hell on earth against the enemy, while the Marines waited behind. Aptly named after the iconic brand of cigarette lighters, the Zippo began spitting flames at ranges that exceeded 200 yards. As the foliage turned into a blazing inferno, the platoon of Marines advanced. The Zippo pushed into the village. The Viet Cong's resolve wavered, their defenses melting away in the searing heat. Amidst the chaos, the Zippo's crew opened fire with its machine gun to suppress the scattered resistance, scorched earth policy at its finest. The last flamethrower tank used in American military service had arrived to change the tide of the war in Vietnam. The use of fire as a weapon dates back to prehistory and has been a constant in military arsenals worldwide. Nevertheless, its most impressive use occurred during World War I, when most European armies employed it, especially the Germans, who developed the Brandwürger M95, a sheet metal tube with an incendiary mixture and a friction igniter activated by a lanyard. This led to the creation of German Flammenwerfer units that used portable flamethrowers to get rid of enemy opposition inside trenches, bunkers, artillery, and machine gun emplacements. France, Britain, and other armies followed, using similar weapons. With the introduction of the tank during the last stages of the conflict, military engineers began to study the feasibility of employing flamethrowers instead of guns once they got close and personal with the enemy. Although the idea never materialized during World War I, development continued during the post-war period, well into World War II. Once again, the Wehrmacht put the flamethrower to good use, especially on the Eastern Front against the Soviet foe. This time, however, the Allied troops gained the upper hand, with more effective ways to employ the flamethrower for maximum efficiency on the battlefield. Flame tanks had arrived to bring hell on earth wherever they went. The U.S. Army and Marine Corps were well-versed in the use of portable flamethrowers and tanks equipped to unleash fire instead of bullets. In the Pacific Theater, they employed portable flamethrowers like the M2A17 and M22 against the entrenched positions of the Imperial Japanese Army. The Japanese soldiers, known for their tenacity and willingness to fight to the last man, were fearsome opponents in their well-fortified hideouts. To combat these defenses, American forces relied heavily on flamethrowers to clear out the enemy's foxholes, pillboxes, bunkers, and tunnels. However, the sheer resilience of the Japanese necessitated a more powerful solution, leading to the adaptation of flamethrowers onto armored vehicles, including LTV Amtraks and tanks. One of the first tanks to be modified was the M3 Stuart light tank, which soon earned the ominous nickname Satan. Weighing over 33,000 pounds and manned by a crew of four, the Stuart was initially armed with a 37mm gun. However, when equipped with a Ronson flamethrower in place of its main gun, it transformed into a fearsome weapon during the Marianas campaign, instilling terror in the enemy as it approached to mercilessly incinerate hostile positions. Despite their effectiveness, the M3's lack of armor made them unsuitable for engaging fortified targets. This led to their eventual replacement by the more robust M4 Sherman tank. Equipped with bow-mounted E-45 flamethrowers, the M4s proved invaluable in close infantry support, becoming a key asset in the American arsenal during the island hopping campaigns. When the Korean War broke out in June 1950, after the treacherous invasion of South Korea at the hands of the North Vietnamese and Chinese, the Marines once again deployed their flame tanks to mercilessly burn the enemy. Nonetheless, the Sherman could not shine, as it could not compete against Soviet heavy armor, prompting the Marines to find a more suitable flame tank that could replace the aging Sherman. This resulted in years of experimentation to develop an effective flamethrowing platform. The prototype was based on the powerful M26 Pershing, an American heavy tank set late in World War II to even the odds against the German Panthers and Tigers. Known as the T-35, the prototype went through several redesigns, experimenting with the turret-mounted flamethrower, a casemate structure, and even a trailer configuration, similar to that of the British Churchill Crocodile, an influential flame tank from the mid-1940s. Unfortunately, the T-35 was cancelled, after the army believed that flame tanks had a limited infantry support role for a new age of armored warfare. The war against Japan had proven the opposite for the Marines, and they began working on a flame tank based on the 90mm gun tank T-42, 
the country's next medium tank of the Cold War. Nonetheless, complications quickly arose with the prototype, and the Marines decided to continue the flame tank program with the M47 Patton II tank. This vehicle answered the Army's desperate need to develop an influential medium tank for the Korean War. As a successor to the influential Mark 46 Patton medium tank, the Patton II featured additional armor and a more modern turret. The Marines' variant was designated T-66 and equipped with a devastating flame projector mounted in the turret instead of the imposing 90mm gun. The Marines' desperation increased after only one prototype was made and the entire project was cancelled. This was expedited because the Army had just introduced the M48, the successor of the M47. The M48 Patton III was the third tank named after General George S. Patton and one of the precursors of armored warfare within the U.S. military. The tank was introduced in 1953 when the Korean War reached a stalemate. It was one of the last American tanks to carry a 90mm gun. It weighed over 50 tons and had armor as thick as 110mm. The Patton III was powered by a 650 horsepower Continental AVSI 1796V12, an air-cooled twin-turbo gasoline engine propelling the vehicle to over 30 miles per hour. The M48 would undergo several upgrades during its service, extending its use well into the 1990s. The Marines quickly switched to the new platform in 1954 with a prototype designated M67. The configuration system, including the turret, was dubbed Flamethrower Turret T7, and it comprised experimental E28 fuel, a pressure system, and the 30R1 flame gun. An external 50 caliber machine gun was mounted in the commander's cupola for increased firepower. With the removal of the weapon, there was no need for a loader, reducing the crew to just three men and adding a 398-gallon fuel tank. A secondary 10.2-gallon fuel container also supplied unthickened gasoline to the atomizer. Furthermore, the entire system was pressurized to 325 PSI, allowing the flamethrower to achieve a 55-second burst and an impressive range of over 280 yards, 256 meters. 24,000-volt spark plug igniters in front of the nozzle inside the firing tube ignited the fuel. The flamethrower was also integrated by a carbon dioxide snuffer system at the nozzle to extinguish any remaining fuel, burning the gun once it was turned off. The M6 flame gun was housed in a system mimicking the 90mm T-54 main gun of the standard M48 Patton to deceive the enemy. The dummy gun barrel had holes in the sides to allow air circulation for combustion. As progress was made with the prototype, the Marines modified the hull, such as flattening the brush guards of the bow headlights due to the flame gun's depression angle. Following rigorous testing and trials alongside the Marines, the Corps received a complement of 56 fully equipped T-67 tanks and 17 T-7 flamethrower turrets. These lethal machines were all based on the M48A1 tank, boasting the M1 cupola, complete with an integrated 50 caliber machine gun mount. Additionally, the surplus 17 turrets were affixed to modified M48A1 hulls. Not stopping there, the T-67 pilot underwent enhancements to meet the M48A1 standard, resulting in a total fleet of 74 tanks. On June 1, 1955, the T-67 was formally standardized as the flamethrower tank M-67, accompanied by the designation of the T-7 turret as the flamethrower tank turret M-1. Following the introduction of the M-48A2, with its larger engine compartment and radiator grille, the M-1 turret found a new home on this updated chassis, giving birth to the powerful M-67A1. Over the years, further enhancements led to the creation of the M-48A3, which featured a robust 750 horsepower Continental ABDS 1792V12 air-cooled twin-turbo diesel engine, an improved gun shield cover, advanced fire control systems, and the addition of an M-73 machine gun. The M-67 flame tank arrived on the scene just in time for the Vietnam War, where it served alongside the self-propelled flamethrower M-132, a variant of the Army's M-113 armored personnel carrier. In the jungles of Vietnam in 1965, the M-67 was often supported by two half-ton trucks loaded with maintenance gear to ensure its readiness for combat. One vehicle was dedicated to transporting and replenishing the tank's napalm reserves, while the other handled recharging the compressed air system. However, this arrangement posed a significant limitation. The need to maintain proximity to the resupply equipment restricted the operational range of the M-67s, limiting the scope of their engagements. The M-67 saw its initial combat engagement in August 1965 during Operation Starlight, also known as the Battle of Van Tuong, marking the first significant U.S. action in the war. 
Tasked with defending the Chulai Air and Command Base, a convoy of Antrax and a three-tank section of M67s fell victim to a Viet Cong ambush in map zone Anquan, resulting in severe losses. Although detailed records are scarce, the M67 actively participated in subsequent operations, like Operation Dozer and the Battle of Huey. Notably, during the latter, two M67s, escorted by M48s, spearheaded the tank advance into the city. The adaptable nature of the M67 proved invaluable in the guerrilla warfare of the Vietnam conflict, frequently employed in rods of flame assaults to scorch suspected enemy hideouts amidst the dense jungle terrain. M67s deployed by the Marines soon gained the nickname Zippo. Like their World War II counterparts, they were used effectively to clear out enemy fortifications, improvise tunnels, dugouts, and caves, and even incinerate large patches of jungles that concealed enemy positions and traps. Still, the M67 was not perfect. Its flamethrower was exceptionally loud, even by tank standards. When activated, the flamethrower generated such intense internal noise that communication between the commander and the gunner via the intercom became nearly impossible. Tank commanders resorted to sticking their heads out of the turret to issue instructions to the gunner, a risky move, particularly in combat situations. This limitation severely hampered the effectiveness of the M67 in firefights, adding yet another layer of complexity to an already challenging battlefield environment. As soon as the United States military began to withdraw from Vietnam in the early 1970s, the Zippo was quickly removed from active duty. By 1974, it had been removed from service without a replacement, becoming the last flame tank employed by the American military. <laughs>